Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're revisiting the work of a truly innovative organization and leaders, uh, the international NGO Kickstart International, which operates in 17 sub-Saharan African countries, including Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, and a list too long to, to uh, mention. And as tremendous expansion plans. And I'm so pleased to welcome our guest, Peter Juma, President and COO, and Martin Fisher, co-founder and CEO, who we've interviewed before. It's great to have you both here, uh, Martin, an old friend. Peter, it's just wonderful to see you uh, here today. Thanks so much for coming. Great. Happy to be here. Good to see you. Well, you, you. I've always been so impressed by your model. And so I, rather than going to you, Martin, as the founder, I'm going to go to Peter and just uh, let's let's start off by Peter. Could you describe Kickstart International's mission from the ground, from the ground in Kenya, where you are and and how you have seen and you worked for, for Kickstart for a really long time, right? Yes, now 20 years, Mark. 30 years. 20. You, 20, 20. How, how did you get involved with, with, with this guy on, uh, on, my, on the other side of the screen? <laughs> um, so, yeah, thanks so much, Mark. And I'm really grateful for this opportunity um, for us to tell our story about what we do and, and how we work. So my background is in finance. Um, I got a degree in finance at the University of Nairobi. I started off in the private sector, um, really focusing on the bottom line, increasing shareholder value and stuff like that. Um, and then I started developing an interest in, um, in the development sector. Um, and so started looking around and I found myself at Kickstart. I signed for a two-year contract, uh, but I've been here for the last 20 years. And I've loved so, it. I love so what what I find really interesting is that you've got a finance background. You get involved yeah. in this crazy business, which is really visionary. It's about taking a need, filling that need, and working on it as a business model. Martin, could you just detail uh, some of the essential features of your business model and how you function as a business, but with a social good orientation and as a nonprofit? Sure, I can kick in there. Or would you rather Peter take you through that? Either way. Either um, way. I got, yeah. Peter, you guys are the experts. Peter, you're, you're Let me do that. there. Tell them, tell them what we do, how we work. <laughs> well, thank you. Again, thanks so much, uh, Mark. Uh, so, so let me begin by saying this. Um, um, I want to say, uh, a little bit about my continent, Africa, and why solving extreme poverty here may be one of the world's biggest and most urgent challenge. And the reason for this is that 80% of the poor in sub-Saharan Africa are smallholder farmers, are struggling to make a living by farming on small plots of land. But just like us, they live in a cash economy. And when you live in a cash economy, uh, your number one need is a way to make a lot of money. If you people have an income security, they can prioritize and address their remaining needs for themselves. And so these poor smallholder farmers need money to pay for everything. Um, with the cash in their hands, they can pay for the farm inputs, clean water, shelter for their families, uh, medicine, pay their children's school fees, uh, buy clothes, food they cannot grow, transport and much more. Without money, they can't. It's just that simple, Mark. Yet, the vast majority of them still do subsistence rain-fed farming, meaning they all plant at the same time when it rains, and they harvest at the same time. And they flood the markets with their crops, selling them at very low prices. Right. Because they are facing oversupply in the market. Then immediately after the dry season sets in, and this long dry season between the rain-fed harvests, food is scarce, prices are very high, and they have very little to eat, uh, and this is what we normally call the hungry season. And when the rains fail, um, come again for the next season, these farmers have very little money to invest in input for their next planting. 
And unfortunately, when the rains fail, um, all their crops are washed away by floods, they lose everything. So basically, we are saying these uh, people are trapped in a, a cycle of poverty. And so Kickstarter as an organization, we play our part to address this challenge. And I will tell you just how we do it. So we are a nonprofit social enterprise uh, with a mission to lift millions of small holder farmers in sub-Saharan Africa out of poverty. And we want them to make a lot of money. And we do this by enabling these farmers to pivot from rain-fed to irrigated farming. And why irrigation? Because we know with irrigation, they can plant high-value crops uh, year-round, independent of the rains, and they can harvest and sell between the rain-fed harvests when the food is scarce and prices are very high. So they so make a lot of money. Time, Peter, you get to time because you can irrigate, you can time yes. your crops and you don't have Absolutely. to get into that cycle of flooding the market, driving down exactly. prices, the exact exactly. time when you have put so much work and you bring your product to market, it is the lowest price. By timing the market, you can look, you can do analysis in terms of the market and you could say, okay, where should I particularly harvest so I'll get a better price for my investment. That's what you're, you're talking about. Exactly. That's what you do. You're basically controlling the, uh, the climate. You are controlling the market. When you know your neighbor is uh, is planting um, cabbages, um, you don't want to compete with him. Uh, you, can, you can do something else or you can wait. Uh, if they are depending on rain, uh, you can wait during the dry season with the irrigation. You can continue with your farming. And so that's something beautiful that ensures these farmers, they have both food and income security throughout the year. And that but, also but, helps in terms of ensuring a diversity of food supplies, which makes the community as a whole more resilient. Mm -hmm. A particular crop okay. that's attacked by disease and everybody's planting the same crop, then everybody okay. has famine all of a sudden. But if you have a diversity of crops and you have communities that are organizing even by just sort of looking over a fence and talking to each other, right? You end up with a more exactly. resilient situation, exactly. right? Exactly, so absolutely. Said, Mark, and the, the key there is really the timing to harvest, right? Because um, moving it so that you can produce and you can harvest a bit later than everybody else, that's when the prices are high and there's no food at all. So, um, and literally the reason this is so important is because there's virtually no irrigation in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, unlike the rest of the world, which is sort of 20% irrigated, produces 40% of our food and 60% of the value, in sub-Saharan Africa, only 4% of farmland is irrigated. And in most of the countries where we work, it's actually more like 2 or 3%. Um, now, if you compare that to Asia, you know, Asia's got about 40% of farmland irrigated. India's over 50%. And we're talking about 2 or 3%. So literally, there's no food between those rain-fed harvests. And that's the key to, to making money. And it's the key to nutrition, as you say, because you can bring the crops out throughout the year and feed your family and feed the community. Um, right. So that's really why irrigation is so powerful. Yeah. But Mark, the, the challenge we face in Africa is um, uh, there are no affordable irrigation technologies. And those that are available are expensive and out of reach of most of these smallholder farmers. Uh, for example, the petrol pumps are expensive. Um, petrol is expensive to buy and hard and dangerous to carry and store. And few farmers in Africa are connected to the national grid, so they can't really afford using electric pumps. And now solar is the buzzword in Africa, um, but most of the solar pumps are too expensive for most of these smallholder farmers. And that's not why Kickstart comes in. Um, so we want to bridge this gap. And what we do, uh, we offer a simple but viable solution for these smallholder farmers. So Kickstart designs, mass produces, promotes, and sells very low cost and easy to use human power irrigation pumps. So with these pumps, uh, which are very strong and durable, uh, the farmers can pull water from surface uh, sources or shallow hand dug wells, uh, that's up to about seven meters uh, deep, uh, about 21 feet, and push it 
uh, to their fields through a hose pipe and spray it onto their crops um, using an efficient um, uh, nozzle or sprinkling. So with these simple tools, they, these farmers can harvest and sell their crops year round and they make a lot of money uh, by just using this simple technology. Peter, you made a really important point in, in, in my estimation. One of the things that, you know, people talk about modern technology and global supply chains and so on. And Martin, we talked about this years ago. The fact is, is that when you start to buy into that system, you become dependent upon it and your income goes to where that system directs your money not necessarily in your interest. So Peter, you said fuel for a gas powered pump, very expensive. The parts right. for an electric power pump, even if it's solar driven, very expensive, right? right? And you have to repair these devices because they're sophisticated. Dust gets into an electric motor, it don't, no longer works, right? If it gets wet, you're it's, it's broken. So all of those are ways that income that you might accumulate immediately gets taken and moved into somebody else's pocket. Whereas your pump, I could pick it up and drop it from a meter. It's, you know, you pick it up and you just continue working on it. I mean, it's it, it's really a very sophisticated technology in its simplicity, isn't it? It is. Um, and we have a very stringent design criteria because um, we developed this pump with a small, the rural small holder farmer in mind. And Mark, as you rightly put it, um, uh, these farmers, they, they are not really sophisticated. They don't, uh, they can't deal with some of these sophisticated, sophisticated equipment. Um, they don't have tools, um, things like uh, spanners or hammers or um, pliers. And so you really need to give them a tool that is, uh, requires minimal, if any, maintenance um, or troubleshooting. And that's, that's how we design our pumps, um, which we branded them Moneymaker Pumps. So they are very simple to use. They are maintenance free. Um, uh, these pumps uh, can be used in any type of water. You can throw this pump in any type of water, whether it's that water, sandy water, salt water, the pump can work. Um, um, whatever source, uh, uh, they are very light uh, because these are very heavy investment for most of these uh, small holder farmers. Somebody putting in a hundred dollars, even one hundred and fifty, even two hundred dollars, that's a major investment for them. You don't, they don't want to lose this equipment. So we've made them light. Uh, the farmer can easily carry it to the field, do the irrigation, and bring it back uh, to their house um, and store it. Uh, they are gender friendly, um, so used by all genders. Um, we developed um, uh, our starter pump uh, is uh, one of the major favorites, especially for uh, for women and girls. Um, and um, I've just mentioned a few of the part of the design criteria that Martin can add. But yes, as you put it, um, we want these farmers to have tools that they are spending very, very little of the income they earn from their farming. Uh, going towards maintaining this pump. We want these farmers, uh, the money they earn to meet their other basic needs, but also the extra income um, that they are earning, they can diversify into other uh, enterprises. So what we have seen with some of the farmers that are using our pumps, uh, having made enough enough money, we've seen some of them now uh, diversifying into other businesses like uh, uh, poultry farming um, or dairy farming. We've seen women opening shops, uh, selling uh, vegetables and supplies to uh, within their communities. And that is um, what we want. That is the concept when we talk about uh, these farm farmers making a major step out of poverty, uh, that uh, they make an investment and the the ROI on that investment is is very high. Yeah. Uh, Martin, could you talk a little bit about the connection between what um, what is being done in your operations across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and the investors that uh, might be outside of Sub-Saharan Africa, and how? the energy flows 
sometimes in the form of money, sometimes in the form of exchanges, um, how that has, you've seen this evolve over the years, right? And and your organization has adapted. I've, I've been following you for, I don't know, uh, 15 years or something. I've seen your personnel adapt. I've seen I've seen your operations adapt. Could you just describe how what you've experienced? Because you're in a a really privileged position where you see things that most of us don't. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So, yeah, I mean, I think when we first suggested uh, way back in in the early '90s um, that the number one need of a of a poor person was a way to make a lot more money, it was almost sacrilege to say that. Um, and uh, people were saying, oh, no, no, poverty is much more about all sorts of other things, um, empowerment and all this. And, and sure, that's true. But if you have a way to make money, then you get all those things. And, and we know that very clearly. Um, and so um, that has become a bit more accepted over the years, um, that uh, money is important. Um, but what happened uh, after, after in the sort of mid-90s was everybody said, OK, money is important. Let's go to microfinance. And there was a huge push to micro lending. Now, micro lending is nice and uh, loan is nice, but only if you have something to do with it, which is going to make you money. Um, and the vast majority of people who get loans don't actually invest in productive assets. Um, so maybe 25% of them do and end up better off. Uh, a lot of them end up in debt. <laughs> and so it's not really having access to loans, which is a critical thing, right? It, it's having a way to make more money, which is critical. Um, and just in along that uh, thread, you know, nowadays people are talking about uh, direct cash transfers where you simply give people cash. Now, that's better than a loan in some ways, because at least you don't get into debt. Right. So you get rid of the bad aspects of a uh, potentially bad aspects of a loan. Um, but on the other hand, again, even if you're just given cash, not everybody is going to invest that in a way to make more money. In fact, the minority is going to do that. And we say much better to have a business in a box where basically this is what you're going to buy and this is going to be a profitable business. And in this case, that's an irrigation pump. You have the rest, you have the land, you have the labor. Plus it connects um, to existing knowledge, right? Because people know how to farm. They just need yeah. water to, to shift the time of when they farm, as, as Peter said, and, and, and to uh, immunize themselves from certain uh, activities. So that process of, uh, of deciding to buy the pump, I mean, that... I thought that was also a really important part of your model. People buy the pump. Exactly. And that was we were some of the very first people to say that, the, you know, the poor actually can invest and, uh, and, and make money from, you know, buying something and making money with it. Um, and that was, you know, the whole concept of social enterprise really started. Um, we were one of the very early you know, players in, in that whole field. Of course, now everybody is a social entrepreneur <clears throat> and, uh, you know, we're actually still a nonprofit social entrepreneur. And the reason for this is because what we're doing is we're overcoming major market failures. There's a lot of for-profit social enterprises. And now a lot of people are saying we want to do good and do well at the same time. But if you think about it, the biggest problems in the world actually come about because of these market failures. You know, we're targeting the very poorest people in the world, the most risk averse people in the world, the people with least access to education who are living, you know, 10, 15 kilometers off of the tarmac, off of the paved roads, um, and who are very, very risk averse because, uh, you know, if they spend their very limited money to buy this product and then it fails, they're going to go hungry. Their kids are not going to be in school. Um, so so because of that, um, you know, you really have to get the, the technology right. Um, and not only that, but they haven't done irrigation is a huge amount of behavior change that has to happen, right? If you're talking to someone about irrigation and they say, well, my parents never irrigated, my grandparents never irrigated, we wait for the rain, we plant with the rain, what are you talking about? Um, the amount of behavior change that has to happen is very, very substantial. Instead of waiting for the rain, planting, waiting for the harvest and harvesting, now you're getting up every day, you're cultivating, you're growing the crops, you're harvesting, you're selling every week, you're selling crops throughout the year, very, very different business. Um, and so we use the donor funds, which are still absolutely required, um, in order to really kickstart that behavior change. And that means people have to see live demonstrations on their farm. They have to be convinced. Um, and you're not going to recover those costs by selling a very low-cost pump. Um, yes, we might have a 20% margin on the, on the FOB price of, uh, of our you know, 
manufactured products. Um, but that's a very small amount compared to all the work that has to be done to really educate someone, teach them how to farm, teach them how to do sustainable irrigated farming, regenerative farming using irrigation and, and make a lot of money. I think um, what, what you, you've, you've raised a lot of really important points. I mean, you're talking about dealing with market failure. You're also talking about knowledge sharing. It's not it's not top down education. It's it's exchange. Right. So you're dealing with the knowledge that people have accumulated through their lives. It's valid knowledge you're bringing to them of another an option. They have to evaluate it, which means the onus is on you to provide them the information so that they can freely evaluate it, reach their own conclusions. Right, Peter? Right. They have to trust the messenger. Right. Mm -hmm. But they're not going to just do this on trust. As Martin says, they have to test it. They might have to test it on their farm in order to be convinced. This is this is huge. You're not going through USAID or a government sponsored uh, package. There's not a corporatized kind of uh, top down kind of imposed. This is all about human to human contact and here's an option right peter and and that's we're right, not talking right. to each other yes yeah. and so uh, just like you rightly put it and martin said so for us um yeah that knowledge sharing and partnering and collaboration is very key and part uh, of our business model so to ensure just like um uh, martin was saying to ensure these pumps reach the farmers um, and the partners um, quickly, easily, and in a very efficient way. Um, so we go through the local for-profit supply chains. And because um, these are business people um, who they already have the knowledge, they, they already have the interactions with the farmers, um, they can extend credit uh, because they are selling within their local communities. And so for us, that's a more sustainable um, way to reach uh, these farmers in a much easier and cost-effective way. And so that was, we part, of the genius, that was part of the genius of, of, of the model that you described all those years uh, ago, Martin. You're, you're doing direct, yes, right? You're interacting, yes, with the farmers, but you're also interacting with the intermediaries. And the thing that I was so impressed with is that within your model is embedded incentives at all levels to be part of this system, right? I mean, this that yeah. I thought that was when I first heard about this, when, when you and I first got to know each other, mm -hmm. I was so impressed by that. Yeah. And if we think about it, you know, the most sustainable thing in any in any society, really, and especially obviously this is the same in Africa, is the local business people. You know, they're out there, they're making a business buying and selling things, and they're selling to farmers, and they're selling farm inputs to farmers. They're selling seeds and fertilizer and other inputs and simple tools. And those are the same people who'd be selling our pumps, right? Um, so instead of sort of competing with those private sector supply chains, we're out there supporting them, uh, working with them, teaching them how to teach the farmers about irrigation. Um, but the one thing that we do a little bit more now than we used to do also, Mark, is a little bit changed in the way that we initially reach the farmers. Um, and for that, we have decided that it's actually useful to work with these partners, the big partners. Uh, many of the biggest NGOs in the world actually now use our pumps in their programs. The uh, big UN agencies use our pumps in their programs. The government agencies use our pumps. Um, and so we use go through them in order to meet the farmers. Because as I described, there's a big behavior change. Um, and these organizations actually already work with thousands of farmers. They have a trusted relationship with those farmers. And therefore, their marginal cost in order to convince a farmer to change their behavior is actually much less than ours if we're going out and meeting the farmer for the very first time. So by going through um, these other organizations, we can leverage their relationships with the farmers to get to know the farmers, and they can make those introductions. Um, but then it's a local supply chain that actually still sells the products, right? Um, so it's still the local shops which are going to be selling the pumps and selling the spare parts because that's a sustainable thing. Um, well, that's, that's really interesting. So that means that now your organization has had to change. 
over the years so that you Absolutely. at all these different levels that you are forming relationships you're if you're if you're dealing with a large uh, international ngo you have to educate those people and you also have to be a service provider on a b2b level right peter yes and that's right. also right. not only in, in at a headquarters that might be internationally anywhere but also yeah. in the various nodes in the various countries and that might be by region or by country so uh, Peter, when you're when you're hiring people locally, and Martin, when you're hiring people locally, when you look at that, how do you create the right skill set over the years, and then manage this very sophisticated, increasingly sophisticated operation? I'll, I'll throw it open to you both. Um, whoever wants to jump in first. Well, I'll, I'll just jump in and say that it's it's not easy <laughs> because we are talking about a mix of skill sets here. We're talking about people who can both get down in the village level and talk to an individual farmer and actually work with and train that individual farmer and, you know, teach them something new and convince them to, you know, adopt and change their behavior. But at the same time, someone who can uh, talk to these partnership organizations, go in and talk to their head of Save the Children or World Food Program in a country and describe to them what it means to introduce irrigation and what the impacts are. Um, and so trying to find people who can bridge that gap but at the same time, also, another third thing is to understand the private sector that also actually, no, we're also supporting the retailers and the importers and distributors, right? right? So it's a real mix of skills that we're looking for. And uh, Peter's yeah. just been uh, working on some of our recent recruitment in uh, Tanzania, for example. And uh, I don't know, Peter, you could take it up and, and say what <laughs> some of these challenges are. But <laughs> you're right. No, Martin, you, yeah, you put it right. Um, sometimes I, when I think about this, um, I normally say uh, this must be one of the toughest jobs. Uh, sometimes uh, when, you, when, when you are recruiting and um, uh, people are asking you questions whether this is a sales job or it's a, a, a fundraising job or um, uh, what type of job is this? Because just like Martin has said, we are working in the private sector and the, the private distributors and the agro dealers are in this to make money. And so you need to convince them that if they bring in a container at which they have invested over hundred thousand dollars, they are not going to be stuck with that inventory in their warehouse. Oh yeah. A very... <laughs> and so, so you have to bring in your sales skills um, um, to find a way when you are approaching these different players out there in the market. Um, that whatever you are telling them, the bottom line is a sale has to happen. But when, when you are reaching out to these organizations, like the, Martin mentioned, like the UN agencies, the World Vision, uh, Save the Children, Care International, Catholic Relief Services, they are in totally different uh, space. Um, they are maybe in WASH programs. They are in um, um, thinking about how they take care of the girl child. Um, and maybe they have not even thought about irrigation. Or even agriculture is not part of part and parcel of what they are doing. And so you really have to, first of all, understand their problem, uh, make them know that they have a problem, and then offer a solution uh, to them and tell them that the solution is for you to put uh, an irrigation pump into the hands of these uh, partners you are working with so that you can have a more sustainable program. So, so there are different skill sets. So in each of the countries where we operate, we have different skill levels. Um, like Martin said, we, we, we need people who can go out there in the village and interact with the farmers and train them. They understand the, the different types of crops in their local language. They understand the pests and, uh, and the diseases in their local language. But at the same time, we also want another level in that country for somebody who can uh, knock on the door uh, of the Ministry of Agriculture in that country and be able to engage with the Minister for Agriculture or the Minister for Irrigation or the Minister for, for Water, or even knock at the headquarters of an international NGO and engage with the regional director or the country director and all that. So, so we have to look at all those skill sets um, and see where uh, each of these individuals fit. But yes, Mark, as you'll say, you'll expect it's, uh, it, sometimes it's quite a challenging job. 
And, um, and you're competing for talent. You're competing for talent with yeah. the ministries. You're competing for talent with the businesses. You're competing exactly. for talent with the international NGOs, yeah. right? Exactly. And then you're talking, I mean, these are very valuable individuals and you have to show a career path for these people, right? Uh, because absolutely. if you don't see a career path, they also need to earn an income, right? They're also thinking about their families. So it's yeah. it, it's it's really sophisticated what you're doing, and th th these are aspects of our of the conversation that when we when we had our last uh, broadcast interview, uh, Martin, uh, mm -hmm. some of these aspects were not really on the on the radar. This is this mm -hmm. is really uh, amazing. What what's your budget now? How have you grown, and and what is your volume today? Yeah, so we're we're selling about. Uh, 20,000 pumps a year we're getting out there, um, which is, you know, it's a lot of families. Uh, it's a lot of people. That's 100,000 people who are now accessing uh, irrigation. Um, our budget is still pretty small. Um, we have a budget of about uh, three and a half, four million dollars. But we can be very, very cost effective, get a lot done. You know, for that price, we're taking, uh, you know, 100,000 people basically out of poverty. How um, many organizations, how many businesses affect that many people on a on a per you know you just you just do the math right yeah. twenty thousand pumps which go to twenty thousand families it's not like people are getting seven pumps right yeah so that's a hundred thousand people right off the bat and in fact what we're finding is people share the pumps so in fact each pump is used more like by a family and a half um, mm -hmm. because they share it out to their relatives they share it out to their friends their neighbors um, and so in fact the impacts are even more. I mean, when we look at our overall impacts, we've sold over the years almost 400,000 pumps now that we've got out there. Um, and we do a lot of impact monitoring, really measure the impact it has on the families. Are they making money? How much money are they making? Are they really climbing out of poverty? And I can talk about all the impacts that we have, and there's a multitude of different impacts. But we are very, very positive that one and a half million people have taken a major step out of poverty using our pumps. And they're also, on top of that, they're producing fruits and vegetables that are feeding about 15 million people. Um, and so with these very small little things, um, and not a very big budget, uh, you can start to have a significant impact. Now, of course, you know, one and a half million people, that's still a drop in the bucket for what's needed in sub-Saharan Africa. The population is growing very, very rapidly. Um, and there's going to be, uh, well, it's going to be 3 billion more people in sub-Saharan Africa by 2100. Um, and so, you know, we've got to create, you know, millions and millions more jobs. But um, what we have is a very, very powerful way to do that. Um, and so we are now, as uh, we've been describing, partnering with all these other organizations and explaining to them why introducing irrigation is so powerful. And I can just touch on some of these, some of these other impacts briefly. Um, but of course, you know, the number one impact, as we say, is the families are making a huge amount more money, right? And not only are they making a lot more money, but that money is now coming in throughout the year. Instead of getting a lump sum when they sell their, their one harvest, they're now getting money throughout the year. And that enables them to, to you know, make all sorts of other investments, as Peter was describing, um, and also be resilient. But the other thing that's happening, Mark, is, of course, as you as everybody's aware, is that the climate has changed a lot. Um, and is changing very rapidly in sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, when I went down to Kenya, you know, almost almost 30 years ago now, you literally could time the rain. You knew every year when the rain was going to come within plus or minus a week. Um, so, you know, you could plan your life and you could plan when you're going to plant and when you're going to harvest. Nowadays, you really can't do that. You have no idea when the rain is going to come. You have no idea when it's going to stop. Um, and when it does come, it often comes in a huge amount of rain. It'll wash away your crops. And so farming has become much, much more risky and much more difficult for these small holders. Well, then you plant, the rains come, you plant, and then it stops. And there's a dry season um, when you thought the rain was going to continue. Um, and so the nice thing about irrigation, of course, is we're planting throughout the year independent of the rain because we're using shallow groundwater. We're using surface water. We're not dependent on the rain. Um, and on top of that, if the rains stop, of course, you can save your crops, your rain-fed crops. Um, because now you have irrigation. So you can actually save them when the rains stop. And if your crops get washed away by a flood, you don't have to worry so much. Of course, you still lose your crop. But what it means is you can replant very quickly because you use the residual water from the flood to plant, and you can keep those plants alive with your irrigation throughout the dry season instead of now having to wait a whole nother year to plant for the next rains. 
Um, so really, in terms of adaptation to climate change, irrigation is absolutely a, probably the number one way that farmers can adapt to climate change. So this is part of the education we have to give. And then if you think about the impacts, well, the impact here is that people are making money. So what do they do? They, they do all sorts of things. Of course, they educate their children. Um, so we have so many kids going to school and going to improve schools and going to secondary schools. I mean, let me just tell you, we've, we've actually literally met kids in the subway in New York City who see a moneymaker, and the moneymaker is our brand for our pumps, who see a moneymaker shirt and say, hey, my mother bought one of those when I was a small boy. She paid for my primary. She paid for my secondary school. Now I'm here at college in the United States. I mean, that's the kind of change that you can bring about once the family starts making money. Um, and that's that's really our mission, is have those kind of changes. And we've and, seen and it time and time again. So this um, feels like... And and honestly, it's it, it it feels like this. It feels like it's time for the next level of expansion. And what I mean by that is a doubling of the budget. So, uh, Peter, we're going to give you the last word. If if we're talking to investors who want to invest philanthropically for the greatest impact in the world, and in particular in in sub-Saharan Africa. How do I think about this as an investor from your perspective? Yeah, thanks, Mark. That's a very good question. So, yeah, like like Martin has said, the um, uh, we already have a very big problem in Africa. Africa is not able to feed its population uh, as we speak, and um, um, Africa population is the uh, rapidly growing. Uh, if you compare to other parts of the world, um, only four uh, percent of farmland in Africa is, is under irrigation. Um, our best estimate, um, we are saying, um, if about twenty million small farmer farmers um, in Africa can engage in full time um, irrigated farming. Um, then Africa can be able to feed itself um, and even be a surplus. And uh, through that, we'll be able to create um, millions of jobs for, for our youth uh, who are being churned out of the universities each year. Uh, but our economies cannot really absorb them into the formal employment. So and if so I for, wrote you a $10 million check, yes, Peter, if I wrote you a $10 million check, what would you do with the money? How many people would be impacted? If I wrote you a $10 million check, how would you uh, expand your, because look, people are giving, people with, with means are giving away money to other things, right? They're, it's going to schools right. or to buildings and they, you know, you have a name on it or whatever it is. But mm -hmm. if, if I wrote that check to you, what would the impact be? So, so Mark, the impacts will be great. Just like we said at the introduction, um, 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 our target countries right now is 17 uh, sub-Saharan African countries, um, where uh, we see a very large potential for smallholder irrigation. Um, uh, currently, um, we are active in just about uh, 10 or 11 of those countries. Um, of course, some of them, there are other issues like the ones we mentioned at the beginning uh, where we have uh, uh, political issues, insurgencies, and all that. Um, but even in the other countries where we have uh, some work going on, we are only scratching the surface. Um, we have one or two people uh, on the ground. Um, we aren't doing much. So um, um, if you were to get uh, a $10 million check, um, of course, um, um, we will expand. We will deepen our reach. Um, um, we'll deepen our partner engagements um, in some of these countries uh, because in, in the countries where we don't have staff who are um, who can go out there and engage with some of these partners that we've talked about, uh, do this training. Um, uh, like we said, um, these small holder farmers uh, need to see and um, uh, and um, um, I mean see the pump. Um, in operations um, so that they can make the decision to buy. Um, and that means we have to do a lot of marketing and promotional activities. So, so you're talking uh, about sustainably expanding the business? 
You're yes. talking about mm -hmm. building out your networks. You're yes. talking about, but and sustainably, right? Because you also have an earned income component as you build it out. You have relationships and an earned income component. So there's also income coming back, right? Mm -hmm. And again, yeah. you're going yeah, to end up with more, more pumps in people's hands, right, Martin? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the bottom line, I mean, for, for 10 million, we'd be, be able to take about a quarter million, 250,000 people out of poverty forever. OK, so for 10 million. So that's about $40 per person. We can take them out of poverty forever. And $40, you know, we all spend uh, quite a bit of money on this coffee. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you think about it, most people probably listening to this are spending about $40 a week on coffee. Um <laughs> And uh, yeah. as a result, you know, for that amount of money, we can take someone out of poverty forever. And when we're talking about out of poverty forever, we're talking about someone who no longer is worried about how to feed their family, no longer worried about how to send their kids to school, is investing in their future, is building new houses, is sending their kids off to college. We were with a farmer the other day who had uh, invested in one of our very low cost pumps. Our low cost irrigation pump is about $75. Now with that $75, you get the pump, you get all the hose pipes, it's plug and play, it's ready to go. Um, and that guy had been making about $50 a month in a factory. That's what he was living on. And you can imagine it's very hard to survive on $50 a month. Um, and he quit his job and actually rented a little plot of land. And he and his wife had got out there with buckets and started to try to irrigate a little tiny plot with buckets. And even there, they managed to make more money than they could that $50. Um, then he invested in one of these $75 pumps. And this is about six or seven years ago. Um, and uh, I went to visit him the other day. Okay, he was now renting about an acre. And he just harvested um, a half acre worth of cabbages. And he just sold them for $2,800. Okay. Um, wow. And when I asked him what he's done with his money, he said, well, Martin, I, I have uh, built a new house at home in my home place. Both of my kids are now in college, in good colleges, um, and my wife has started the shop. And I said, that's fantastic. What else have you done? He said, well, I'm saving money. Um, and I said, what are you saving money for? He said, I'm saving money to buy a plot of land in Nairobi. And I'm like, well, that's going to be about 50,000 US dollars. He says, yes. And I'm almost there in six years. So he's almost wow. saved 50,000 to buy a plot of land. But that's the kind of change that's happening. And you can see all of the, you know, the number of people that he employs. He employs four people on his farm. So all of them have money now too, right? Um, so the effects go far beyond just the, the families. So when we're talking about this year, 250,000 people out of poverty, um, actually the impacts are much, much bigger. Um, and then on top of that, you know, he's renting out his pump, he's lending his pump to, to other neighbors. Um, so so in Not terms of the, you know, the impact- Yeah, the investment. Yeah. 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 You, you want to have the last word? Yeah, I just wanted to add the last word. Uh, um, of course, um, we are a technology company. We um, we we want to continue innovating new uh, technologies and new um, um, services. Um, we are now going beyond just the physical uh, physical technologies. Uh, now we are also innovating in new ways and new methods of uh, training farmers and. Um, um, adding other uh, solution to irrigation so that we provide a full package to the farmer other than just the pump. So we are talking about things like uh, water harvesting technologies. We are talking about uh, things like um, uh, efficient ways of um, of growing for those farmers uh, who are, for example, in uh, in the suburbs of. Uh, the cities like Nairobi, uh, can they do uh, kitchen gardening? So we are thinking of uh, coming up with things like uh, vertical gardens, um, uh, which they can use to grow crops, um, um, to feed themselves uh, for nutrition, and also uh, maybe just to sell to sell to, to their neighbor. So um, um, with additional funding, there's so much that, that we can do um, in terms of expanding um, and deepening our operations, uh, coming up with new new ways and coming up with new uh, new technologies. Um, we are developing um, a, a solar pump uh, and a, line, a range of other things that we have in the pipeline as far as our product development is concerned. Like any business, you continue to innovate Thank you so much for explaining parts of your model, and we have to we have to do this again because I mean we could we could go on and on uh, on this because it's so textured, it's so sophisticated, 
And it's it's so evolved uh, and it continues to evolve. Peter Juma, president and COO, Martin Fisher, co-founder and CEO of Kickstart International. It's been a real, real pleasure and so very educational. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks a lot, Mark. Great to see you again. Thanks.